Hello, welcome to Maraba Asset. I am Elizabeth Hidokuro-Rislasi. Maraba Asset is a YouTube and Facebook-based platform where we present diverse range of programs in Tigrinya, Amharic, and English language. We aspire to be the platform for genuine and brave dialogue on issues that affect society on different levels. Our next guest is William Davison, a senior analyst at the International Crisis Group in Ethiopia. Here he is now talking with Tahle Haile Selassie. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our show. We have a special guest today, uh, William Davison, a senior analyst um, for the uh, International Crisis Group um, on Ethiopia. He's uh, based in Nairobi um, after having been uh, pushed out of Finfine, Ethiopia. Um, and uh, today we will- Pushed out for the second time. For the second time, okay. Thanks for the correction. Uh, no, so that's today... not a correction, an addition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll focus on the war on, on, on Tigray, if you'd agree with my phrasing, uh, William. I, I know you use uh, the conflict in, in Tigray, but I would, I would rather call it war on, on Tigray. Um, I tend to use conflict and war interchangeably, I think. Yeah, it, yeah so to give a, a, a brief uh, summary, the, the war started on the 4th of November, um, according to the government's telling, uh, after the, the Tigray government um, allegedly attacked a military base in, 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 in Matale, around uh, Matale, and dozens of massacres have been committed since, um, countless of atrocities have been committed, thousands have fled to, to Sudan, and millions of people are on the brink of starvation. And factories have been looted, um, infrastructure has been totally uh, destroyed, and because of the telecommunication uh, blackout, we haven't been able to get a full picture as to what has uh, transpired. So what we know so far might be tip of the iceberg. and. Um, worse things uh, could have been uh, committed. M my question to you, um, William, on the on the 30th of October mm -hmm. 2020, so that would have been one roughly one month before the war started, uh, you wrote a briefing for the International Crisis Group um, titled Steering Ethiopian Tigray Crisis Away from, mm -hmm. from, from Crisis. Yeah, but 30th of uh, October was just a few days before the conflict. Four days before the conflict, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm wondering, did you see any of the things that we have come to witness coming then? <laughs> what was the rationale for writing that, that briefing? What did you see then? Sure. Um, thanks, thanks, Tekla, and thanks, thanks very much for having me. I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. Um, I think... Um, I think the previous briefing was was in August, um, similar sort of heading as I remember. And I think even in August, um, I, along with many other people, um, was incredibly worried about the trajectory um, that um, Ethiopia, and more specifically the federal and Tigray governments were on, um, in terms of it looked like um, it was a, a collision they were on a collision course, as we say, and it wasn't clear how they were going to get off it. Um, I think after that August briefing, the developments through September, obviously the holding of the regional election, the reaction to it um, from the federal authorities, um, that I think solidified that impression that the parties were on a collision course to war. Um, finally, um, I had been prevented from traveling Along with the just expelled Simon Marks, uh, we were both stopped at Bole Airport um, at the last second um, from traveling to the Integre during the regional election. Um, no, no particular reason given as, as usual, um, but there was all this stuff sort of trying to intimidate reporters and people from observing the election that was seen to be lending legitimacy to Tigray's election by the federal authorities. Point is, um, I took a few weeks, um, let things sort of whatever cool down. And I'd finally made it to Mechele um, in mid mid uh, October. Uh, can't remember the exact dates uh, between the fifteenth and the twentieth, that type of thing. 
and I spoke to a fairly good uh, selection of um, the top officials in Tigray, as well as former officials, former CPLF members, people like the late uh, Abai Tsehai and, um, and the late uh, Sir Meskin, who have obviously been you know, victims of this conflict. Um, there was um, a very clear position. Obviously, there was some um, diversity of viewpoints in, in Mehele, but there was a very clear position from, from, the, from the government. Um, I can go into that if you want. Um, and so I returned from Mekele even more alarmed from the perspective of, you know, what are the chances of war here? And, and then sort of what needs to be done to avoid it. And of course, the problem was that all the things that needed to be done to avoid the war um, were not practical, let's say. So I you know, went back to Addis and spoke to some senior officials, um, not many, because it was quite hard to, to meet people um, last year and add as senior people for me. Um, but I spoke to sort of senior PM advisor, um, minister, um, senior PP, this type of thing, um, Aidan Farah at the House of Federation, the speaker. And I informed them of um, my understanding of the situation and my understanding of the Tigray government position. Um, and the responses of the federal officials made it absolutely obvious. Um, there was no doubt in my mind whatsoever um, that, that war was, was coming and it was a question of when, not if. Um, should, there be, should, should there not be um, some sort of dramatic shift in attitude and so policies um, from you know, one or hopefully both of the two main actors? So that was the, um, the genesis of, the, of that October the 30th briefing. I obviously communicated to my bosses at crisis group said how alarmed I was by this, this situation and we rushed out um, that briefing. Um, and just to finish, what I didn't know um, was the conflict was going to become so quickly. Um, I thought that the federal squeeze on Tigray um, meant that the federal government was willing to be quite patient and try and weaken Tigray um, before an intervention to remove the regional government. Mm. But the issue was that the Tigray leadership was not willing to allow themselves and Tigray's government to be weakened by the federal government. Um, they realized that that would put them in a more vulnerable position. And I think it was those types of dynamics that led to the rapid escalation. Um, and then of course, it's essentially conjecture. Um, but then we also have the uh, US presidential election. And personally, I would say, um, justified um, suspicion that um, the start of the military operation, um, there was no <clears throat> accident or people, certainly people were not displeased um, to find that occurring at exactly the same time of that, that momentous um, political event for the, for the world. Mm. Um, interesting. Um, if, um, if you don't mind, uh, I would want us to to expand on the the, the nature of conversation you you had with the senior people in in Matala uh, before the the war started. You're telling me that you had uh, discussion with Siyum and with uh, Abbas Haye, and surely they must have told you their assessment at that moment in time, and you would have gathered something from that conversation. And if you could go a little bit deeper on that, and my second question would be: You're telling me that. Uh, for you, it was a matter of uh, when, not of if. Yes. But the unless, government. Unless, unless, there was a, going to be, unless there was a shift in position. If, if things continued along that trajectory, it was when, not if. Absolutely. Uh, but the government, still to this day, um, keeps on saying that the war was forced upon it out of, out <laughs> of nowhere, really. That the government wasn't thinking in terms of going to war and that it was arm twisted in a way after the, the Tigray government uh, suddenly um, attacked a, a military base. That, that, that is what they, they say. And you're saying that you saw it coming. It was a matter of when. Now, how do you, how do you square the, this, these two things, if you could? Well, because as with any war, um, to my understanding, there is also um, you know, there's a physical war with 
guns and bombs, and then there's also an information war, a propaganda war. And quite often, again, to my understanding, a key element is, you know, the, some form of the blame game. Um, and the one side wants to sort of adopt the moral high ground, perhaps for its own reasons to make itself feel better, um, perhaps for a domestic constituency, perhaps for an international constituency, they want to be able to say, they started it, you know, what, what, what could we do? Um, we were forced into this by the irresponsible actions um, of, the, um, of our opponent. I mean, I think you don't need to go that much deeper to understand the sort of psychology or the, um, the sort of reasoning behind the uh, Northern Command attack narrative, let's say. Um, if, you know, I could very quickly give my version of this, which I've given before, including, you know, in a long interview with ESAP. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I did. I mean, one, one point I've made elsewhere is that, you know, at the point when Tigray's government, um, in conjunction with a certain proportion of uh, mostly, if not exclusively, Tigrayan officers and soldiers within the federal, the northern command of the federal military. At the point when they try and um, move the northern command from being in control of the, the federal government, the commander in chief and the chief of staff, um, and they put it in the services of the regional government, which is about to be um, to face uh, an attempt to remove it by the federal authorities, including the rest of that military, of course. But that is civil war. At that, at that moment, that's civil war. So, of, you know, of course, it, of course the, you know, the Northern Command incident, the attack, the defection, the attempt to commandeer the heavy weaponry, um, and that, that those, that's essentially the defection from the federal military into the regional forces, what became the Tigray Defense Forces, notably a name which parallels the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, right? Um, that is civil war. That's the outbreak of civil war. Um, but to say that it was a surprise attack um, or that there was no indication of, <clears throat> of federal intervention or the use of force was just abject, obvious, transparent nonsense. Um, we had... Um, you know, fairly high profile speech from the prime minister a few months earlier where he was talking about the dangers of running an illegal election and how mothers and children would suffer if people went ahead and ran an illegal election. I mean, that's just rhetoric, but I think that's an indication that it was on the cards. Um, and then we have the decisions taken by the House of Federation, which essentially authorized the enactment of the you know, federal intervention in regional states proclamation. I can't remember the exact title of it. Um, but because the election was classified as illegal, um, therefore the new Tigray executive, the, you know, the state council and the, the cabinet was classified as, as illegitimate. That, that was the legal federal authorization to remove Tigray's regional government. That, you know, that's why I was writing reports about it. Um, mentioned it in the June report about the Amhara Tigray territorial dispute. I'm sure you don't like that phrasing, but about those Amhara claims on Tigray's territory and mentioned it there, mentioned it in August and then this October the 30th briefing. And the, I, the idea it was a surprise attack is, is an absurdity. That's just a propaganda device um, for people who are trying to, um, trying to convince as many people as possible that they are in some way not to blame and, and the other side is, is exclusively to blame. It indeed is absurd to say that it was a, a sudden uh, attack, but I, I asked you because the, the, the international media uh, almost invariably uh, seemed to have latched on to the, to the government's line. And now they, they, they almost say that the, the war started after the TPLF attacked a, a military base and they state it as a matter of fact, not even as a matter of opinion. And even the minimum amount of scrutiny and trying to understand the situation would tell you that, like you say, that it was always a matter of where that the government, federal government was always uh, going to crush the TPLF because it defied its, its uh, orders. And what is not 
clear to me is why the 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 Western media, if I could use that term again, say keep on saying that the, the war started, that the war was essentially started by the TPLF, that the federal government couldn't couldn't help, and that if if the federal government is to, to blame for anything, it is for the for the way it managed the war, not not for for starting the war. And I, I wonder if you have those similar concerns. I do, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think, obviously, as someone who worked for a long time in international media, um, and then someone who you know knows and works closely with with journalists as well as following the media now, I have plenty of exposure to this type of thing. Um, you know, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to sort of spend. We shouldn't spend too long on this. I, I, I guess I'll just try and be brief. But you know, the the, the media, you know, the international media, especially when they're writing about places like Ethiopia, which is sort of not that prominent on the radar of their readers and <clears throat> people in the states and Europe, um, they like simplicity. They like brevity. Um, they like clear, clean, clear explanations. Um, so you could be a reporter, and you could say, "Hang on a minute, you know." If we just describe the war as having been started by a TPLF attack or a Tigray attack, as it should be, or a you know, whatever the, the military defection <clears throat> on the Northern Command, then we're missing all this build-up that was you know, clearly relevant. But the editor will just sort of tell you, "Well, you know, we don't have space for that. People don't, people don't really care enough." Um, and isn't it true that the Tigrayans attacked the Northern Command? And then you'll be sort of like, yeah, that's true, but and they'll say, well, if it's true, you know, that's the start of the war. So we're not wrong to say it. And then, you know, you, that, that conversation will be had. It will be inserted as background in a story. Then some, another editor will come along and they'll insert the same background from the previous story. So now they're in an established habit of like, this is our stock line, our stock context line for describing the outbreak of the conflict. So it's nothing, so I don't think it's anything more sinister than those sorts of dynamics within the media. And of course, this is just a matter of journalists and editors and also people like us, you know, contacting journalists and editors and the organization saying, hang on a minute, you know, I think you could be doing this differently because of these reasons. And I'm sure you do yeah. stuff like that yourself. And then I think the other thing here is that this sort of like, um, there's a sort of, you know, there's a, there's a sort of clear bias towards governments, right, and authority. And I think there is a tendency for, you know, your average sort of whatever, like Reuters senior editor and <clears throat> somewhere, they're going to be more inclined to believe the sort of Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, led government um, than this sort of dissident regional <clears throat> types. Uh, there's just that sort of bias. Um, and you, the media always gives a lot of space to official voices. And we have to remember here um, this is a government that does many things pretty, pretty badly, but in terms of selling, establishing its own propaganda lines and then, and then repeating them and sticking to them, it's, it's pretty good. And, and I think the whole, they killed the soldiers during their sleep, um, which may or may not have occurred. I don't really, don't really know. Um, and the attack on the Northern command and, and all the rest of it, this was a, a narrative a version of events that was very successfully sold, not just to the media, also to foreign governments initially, African Union um, entities, entities like this. And that meant that there was a lot of scrutiny, um, obviously combined with the complete information and physical blockade on Tigray. That meant that the government was able to successfully sell this war. And of course, Abby told everyone that this would take, what, like a few hours or, a few, or 10 days or something. And, and people bought that initially. Um, so they, <clears throat> part of the media's failings on that particular issue is that they were quite inclined, uh, institutionally, systemically inclined to believe the federal narrative. And then the federal narrative, we may not like it, we may not believe it, but it was something that was sold and propagated, uh, disseminated quite, quite effectively. Mm. Interesting. Uh, if, if we could go back to, to that same um, briefing, William, if, if you don't mind, one mm -hmm. of the recommendations, one of the recommendations that you make um, in that briefing mm -hmm. is that you say Tigray should water down its demands. Sure. And for us who had to rely on the, 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 
public press statements that they were issuing, mm -hmm. the the one overarching demand that they were making was that there should be an all inclusive dialogue. That that yeah. would be the only the, the only way to solve the problems in long term. Sure. And now, especially with the benefit of hindsight, that seems to have been the, the right demand to to make, right, for, for the TPLF. But apparently, you must have found that demand a bit too strong. Um, yeah. So, which which aspect of the demand that they were making, and especially given that you have had mm. discussions with the with the top brass like Sir mm -hmm. and uh, Abbas Haye, which aspect did you find a little bit too too strong a demand to be accepted by the or to be acceded to by the federal government? Sure. So, if, just a couple of things. Um... I just mentioned Abai and, 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 and Siam by name, partly to sort of you know, pay, pay respect to them um, because they've um, been killed during this war. Um, but I, I did need the regional leadership, right? So, the mm. Dr. Um, yeah. Fet Fet yeah. Um Yeah. Katachi read a brief briefly, and uh, other people um, <clears throat> on the more kind of security side. Um, and just, just to clarify one thing, you say it's the right demand. You mean because that Ethiopia is in such a kind of giant overall political mess that um, that, that kind of all-inclusive dialogue is, is necessary? Is that why you say it's the right demand? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the, the, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, the, the, the point was that, you know, crisis group uh, consistently has said that um, because of the nature of the political disputes in Ethiopia, the, the fundamental nature of the divisions over this sort of legacy of the imperial era, let's say, disputes over the federal system and the, the divisions and the power struggles that have been bred by that and accompany those disputes, we're fully in favor of a fundamental political negotiation um, involving all, all key actors, as many actors as possible. We don't think it would be easy to organize. There would be all sorts of disputes. And because of the fundamental nature of the divisions, it would be an incredibly difficult, frustrating discussion. Um, but absolutely, it's necessary. In fact, one of the things that Abai told me, and he, this, this was one of the things where it wasn't, <clears throat> it's not, not something everyone was saying, but you know, even the, he, and I guess parts of the TPLF establishment, let's say, they wanted a constitutional renegotiation um, because as far as they were concerned, the protection for minority states' rights, just the protection for minority states within the federal system, um, evaporated with the dissolution of the EPIDF. So that obviously allowed you know, the 25% um, vote, regardless of population size. And, and without that safeguard, um, Abai was of the opinion that the Tigray and, and states with it like it with significantly smaller populations. They needed some sort of protection at the constitutional level to ensure their rights and to, sure, and to ensure that they didn't suffer in a majoritarian federal system. Point is that, you know, the TPLF wanted a, so these kind of figures wanted a, um, a constitutional discussion. Um, obviously those who opposed the constitution wanted a constitutional discussion. Um, I guess other entities, if some or more elements want to, um, want a discussion um, and a constitutional discussion. And, and so it just seemed like the, um, like something which is necessary um, in, in Ethiopia. Um, of course, you know, other, other entities want to see a proper implementation of the constitution. This isn't something that, that we oppose at crisis group. And the suggestion that um, the demand should be watered down um, and really just kind of temporarily put on hold um was because um so could you just give me one sec one second um, sure sure hi yes um i'm just i'm busy so okay um sorry so yeah so so just re rewinding a bit so uh, it wasn't something that we um that we opposed it was just about the timing and because of the urgency and the gravity of the situation now you know we felt like there was some possibility um, some last gasp chance that you could have talks between the main protagonists to try and prevent um, a deterioration in a situation that was leading to conflict. 
our focus was on the, the fiscal, the budgetary issues, um, with a decision by the House of Federation basically to redirect um, the subsidies, um, the, the, the transfers, um, away from the executive to the lower echelons of Tigray's government. That obviously wasn't going to fly in Tigray. So we were focused on that, you know, can, can the federal government delay those, delay that measure? Because that's going to exacerbate the situation. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, we, 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 we said to uh, the Tigray region's leadership, we said, you know, realistically, like because of the urgency of this situation, like to ask for Jawar and Eskinder and Bekele and all these characters to be released from jail, um, to take part in an inclusive dialogue, that's making even less likely the chance of that dialogue occurring. And unless some sort of dialogue occurs, then we're going to keep moving along this path towards conflict. So the point was that, like, let's have a discussion about the things that are the, the, the key elements that, that are taking us on this path to conflict between Tigray and the federal government. Again, those fiscal issues, the election. Um, you know, let's 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 talk about them. Um, the relations between the federal and regional government generally, um, and let's not muddy the waters with these other issues now, because that makes any form of direct talks less likely and, and therefore takes us closer to war. So that was the, that was the basic ra rationale. It, it wasn't some rejection of the idea that an inclusive dialogue or, or some sort of discussion about Ethiopia's political settlements is, is necessary, because it absolutely is. Yeah, but I, I ask that because, uh, in my opinion, the, the whole thing boils down, the debate boils down to, to whether the Tigray people have the right to self-administration or not, mm -hmm. right? And if you believe that they have the right to self-administration, then you would grant that they have the right to, to hold elections whenever they deemed it appropriate, even in defense to the federal government. And it was it isn't the federal government's business to go into gray and middle and tweak with election dates and, and stuff. And that, that doesn't seem to be the, the assessment of, of the international community. They seem to, to believe that the federal government had the right to interfere if Tigray went ahead with, with elections. And for me, that, that is a, a binary thing. You either accept that the Tigray people had the right to do that or you don't accept and there is nothing to, to be watered down that that is how I, I see it maybe you maybe you slightly differ here I don't know you, you could yeah, think, you could uh, I think so yeah um I think there's various ways of of, of looking at this um and you know one way is to look at the sort of Yes, the text, but also the sort of spirit of the constitution, um, which is obviously, you know, about a federation formed um, by the nations, nationalities, and, and peoples with those rights to self determination, could not be more prominent um, in in the document, to my as I, as I understand it. So I think it's it's clear where the type of argument you're making um, comes from. But then if we sort of stick with that constitutional issue. Um, we can also see that um, on the federal side of the argument, there was the explicit role of the House of Federation in constitutional interpretation. Now, I know there was a debate about whether interpretation was actually what was occurring. Um, uh, there, was, there was, you know, a fairly kind of learned and extensive discussion about these, these constitutional issues. Uh, the other parts of the federal argument, um, of course, were, you know, once the House of Federation has has ruled on on a constitutional issue, then that is binding um, across the Federation for all its members. Um, and so therefore, that Tigray election, which you consider most importantly as an act of self-determination, others are interpreting and classifying as a defiance of federal authority after the House of Federation ruling. So there was that dispute, which obviously feeds into this, um, feeds into this, into this debate. Um, there's another point I wanted to make here. Um, I, I can't, I can't recall it right now. Um, I think the point, the point, the other point I wanted to make was that if we zoom out a bit. 
um, and we take your, your line of, of argument, let's say, you know, all that's happened here is, it is an act of, of democracy. You know, it's an act of popular democracy to hold an election. You know, it isn't, um, it isn't an attack on the federal military, you know, for example, in terms yeah. of provocations to a federal government, provocations to a federal system. Now, I'm not downplaying the, the, the very serious nature of the dispute in terms of those, that constitutional dispute, the right of a region to run an election autonomously without an, an explicitly against the federal government ruling. I'm not downplaying that, but also if we zoom out, it is an act of democracy. It's not the most provocative threatening thing in the world. And, you know, it seems to me that, <clears throat> especially given the power that the prime minister and the ruling party has at the federal level, they could obviously have taken a, a different approach here, I think. Um, they could have said, well, that, that regional government is being incredibly defiant. Um, but, you know, we're not going to take action which exacerbates the situation. Instead, a pretty legalistic approach was taken um, from the federal government. And I think that's part of the, the, the broader political dispute. Um, then we're into the deeper territory of where, you know, where did this war really come from? Who, who wanted it the most? How long was it something which major players, powerful players were entertaining as a possible eventuality and a way to resolve as they saw it, some of Ethiopia's deeper political disputes. Um, I'm not downplaying the seriousness of that federal, uh, the, dis the, 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 the dispute over the constitution and, and the federal government's kind of legalistic legal right to respond in the way it does. But it, it also seems that given that it was an act of too much democracy, you could say, and that they could have taken a more kind of permissive political politically led approach if they were doing their best to avoid conflict and yeah that was also part of the the um the crisis group reasoning and and publicly expressed concerns um that you know action should not be taken by the federal government that, that exacerbates the situation and takes us closer to conflict yeah well i i I don't really want us to, to dwell on the, the legal uh, aspects, not least because I'm, I'm not a legal expert. Uh, and yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, but I mean, one could have debate and discussion about the manner um, with which the, the election was postponed. You could question whether the right kind of discussions were had. You could, uh, uh, you could debate about the the legality of it and and all of that but ultimately yeah. i think the right question, think, yeah yeah just because i think you know the lack of consultation with regional governments during the constitutional yeah. interpretation process seemed like a yeah. fairly major omission like given the nature the character of ethiopia's federation you know they yeah. they, they essentially delayed regional governments from um re-electing their state council within the constitutional mandate without asking them to Again, to my understanding, you know, there was certainly no major extensive formal consultative, let alone decision making role for the regional government. So that seems like a fairly major um, misjudgment um, in that process, for example. Yeah, but one, one uh, interesting thing for me is the, the rationale that was given for postponing the, the election. And mm -hmm. it was that the, the pandemic, right? It, it, mm -hmm. they, they say that elections couldn't be had because of the pandemic mm -hmm. and the the election was postponed indefinitely and the condition that they gave was they were going to wait until the world health organization gave the, the go ahead essentially until they said that elections are safe now now there hasn't been such pronouncements from the world health organization and by every indication the pandemic is actually worse now in ethiopia than it was one year ago and they are going to have elections now so clearly they were, that was a lie the, the reason the excuse given was a lie and that was one of the points that the Tigray government made that the pandemic was being used as an excuse to postpone the election so that in that in that in that both time the federal government will jail people who it thought were uh, formidable opponents and indeed that has come to pass as well so do you Again, you, you might not think this is an important discussion to, to be to be had now, but do you think that the Tigray government has been 
vindicated, at least in that respect, in, in, in saying that the federal government was using an excuse to postpone an election to do its dirty job of jailing opponents. Yeah, I mean, so I, I certainly sort of you know, wouldn't subscribe by any means to all of the things that you, you just said, I, but also I wouldn't, wouldn't totally um, disagree with them. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into kind of COVID uh, related discussions, COVID, but, um, Obviously, there was a lot of concern in, in early 2020 about just how damaging the pandemic would be. Uh, we, we, know, we know more about, um, obviously, its effects and trajectory now than we did then. Um, I think that's something to bear in mind. I, this indefinitely thing, like, I, I understand, but I think, you know, the, they said, they, to, m to my recollection, they said that when the Ethiopian um, health authorities deemed conditions safe enough to sort of think about an election, then they had nine to 12 months, I think, wasn't it? Yep. To run an election. Um, yep. So, you know, but I think, you know- That, 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 yeah, yeah. that hasn't happened. That, I, I think that's a very important detail, right? So that was the condition they said will change the situation. But to my knowledge, that hasn't happened yet. The, the, the health authority, authorities haven't said that. Um, they, did say, they, did, they did say something in, um, they they said something in like like September or October or something. They, there was there was a there was a kind of an announcement from the Ministry of Health, I think. But anyway, um, look, I think suffice to say there were public health authorities all over the world, including Ethiopia, who are saying you don't run elections because it's going to increase transmission of this deadly virus. There's, undoubtedly, those voices existed in Ethiopia clearly, um, but. You know, a couple of things. One, uh, the electoral board was, we've seen the, the, the struggles of the election board recently in this increasingly difficult security environment, but that's also down to its own operational weaknesses, manage, managerial weaknesses. The electoral board was not ready to hold the election on the original scheduled date of the 29th of August before the pandemic. So, you know, there was already there was already a, a major issue there, um, and then when, then we're into the more political realm of things, um, and it becomes you know, obviously very difficult to be sure about people's intentions. Um, in general, my view, the crisis group view, was that prior to the pandemic, it seemed that particularly in Oromia, a prosperity party faced a gigantic challenge. Um, from the uh, OFC combined with the OLF um, after Jawa's move to join um, OFC. Um, and it's easy to, it's easy to, to, to think and to construct an argument that, um, that, that the authorities and the ruling party only really got enthusiastic about the election after they were able to sufficiently suppress um, that opposition momentum in Oromia. I think, you know, it's easy to make a case for that. Of course, it's a very difficult thing to prove, um, but exactly how that fits into um, you know, the decision-making surrounding COVID, I do think it's, a, I do think it's a, a somewhat complex thing. I think people were correct to describe um, the pandemic's arrival as a blessing in disguise for the authorities, because it allowed them to delay an election that they might well have lost um, and therefore give them more time to prepare the electoral ground um, so it was more conducive to a PP victory. And of course, that's exactly what we have now. Um, I made comments at the time, you, Crisis Group published on it. Other people wrote, um, including for the, the website I founded, Ethiopia Insight, describing the pandemic as providing this type of opportunity. And of course, it provided opportunities for governments, including authoritarian governments, across the world to pursue their agenda. Um, one theory about Eritrea is that the very dramatic lockdown, um, and don't ask me more about this because I haven't gone into any research detail on it, but the very dramatic lockdown in, in Eritrea um, that followed COVID's arrival was partly used to mobilize for the upcoming intervention in Tigray, for example. So governments across the world, including um, 
allegedly Eritrea's used COVID for their political advantages. I, I do think to some extent that occurred, but it, it really is hard, obviously, to, to prove these things. Okay, uh, so one one last um, remark regarding that that uh, press briefing. Um, so you 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 end that that statement by by giving a very grim um, warning. You you say so that which, if, which statement? The, the the one on the thirtieth of October, four okay. days before the war. So you say that okay. if the parties went ahead with war, then you say it would rip. Ethiopia asunder, that it would rip Ethiopia apart. That that is right. the, the wording you use. Right. And in, in the in sure the face of I'm sure we qualified that. I'm sure we said it might. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but my, my question to you, uh, William, now in the face of what has since transpired, in the face of mm -hmm. all the evidence for the last seven months now, do you do you think you have been maybe vindicated is the right word, I, I don't know. Do you think you, your warning was was absolutely right? Do you believe that EKP has now been uh, ripped apart? Is that your assessment? Well, I think the, you know, the classic kind of like cop-out answer is it's sort of too early, to, too early to tell, right? So again, you know, hard to be definitive about things, but um, those concerns very much still exist. Um, I do see, you know, in, in the same way um, that I was describing things before, if things continue along the current trajectory, and there does seem to be a continued deterioration in the political and security environment, which is going to put increasing stress uh, on the state, on the federal government, and its ability to control all of Ethiopia's territory, as we're very much seeing already. And then to be more specific, again, you know, when those elements of the Northern Command switched over to the regional side, that was civil war. That's also a, gig a gigantic blow to the integrity um, of Ethiopia's federation. Um, and so when we were using this language, we were thinking um, about the inevitability um, that conflict between Tigray and government and the federal government would cause these kinds of splits within the military. Ethiopia's military has obviously been a powerful actor, both domestically um, and, and regionally. And so it's a, it's a huge blow to Ethiopia's capacity as a federal state. That's obviously occurred. Then we've had this brutal war um, in Tigray, which has created further stresses um, on the federal defense forces with former colleagues from the ENDF lining up against each other again, a massive blow um, to the strength, the capacity um, of Ethiopia's federal government and therefore the integrity of the state and the system. Um, th these, are, these are very, very worrying developments. And that's just talking about <clears throat> the military. Then we have the, the political uh, dimensions of this, which I was aware of um, and was probably a little bit cautious on um, and I got you know, rightly criticized for some descriptions of the, the level of popular support for the TPLF and the attitude of the Tigrayan people around the election because I wasn't there, I wasn't allowed to go by the government, um, federal government. Uh, it was hard to tell from a distance. Some opposition parties boycotted. Anyway, my point is that I was aware that there was going to be you know, quite considerable Tigrayan anger and support anger at the federal government support for the Tigrayan leadership. But the way things have transpired has obviously caused this gigantic rift, um, not just between Tigrayan political elites and military elites and the rest of the federation, particularly Amhara government and elites and, and those in Addis, um, but it just seems to have a huge amount of popular support. So, you know, where's that taking things? And, you know, I'm sure we'll get onto these issues, but you know, not only do I not see a clear resolution to this conflict at the moment, but the idea of reconciliation um, between the TPLF, Tigray's government, and broader Tigrayan society, particularly those with some sympathies towards sort of Tigrayan nationalism, reconciliation with um, existing powers in the rest of the, the Federation, it's sort of almost inconceivable at the moment. Um, and so that is, again, a huge risk to the integrity. And, and so is part of this idea that this conflict 
um, could uh, rip the state asunder indeed. Um, and then, of course, the rest of the arguments would be about the the exist the other existing political problems of which um, the Tigray federal war is just the most serious expression of, um, but also is something which feed, feeds back and exacerbates the political problems in other parts of the country um, for various reasons, um, whether it's due to the preoccupation and the weakening of the federal security apparatus because of the civil war in Tigray, um, or whether it's for, um, you know, potentially emboldening other political movements, particularly as they, as they sense a weakness from the federal government. So it potentially exacerbates other very serious political problems in Ethiopia, most notably in Oromia, but also in Beni Shangul, increasingly in Amhara, including the divisions that are growing between Amhara and political communities quite broadly. Um, and those are obviously things which create a threat to the integrity of the state as well. So you know, none of this has happened definitively, but it, it is hard to imagine you know, Tigray coming back into the Federation, let alone into a, you know, if there was some complete reworking or abolishing of the Federation. Uh, very hard to imagine Tigray um, coming back into the fold then. And then we have all these other problems as well. So, yeah, no, I think that that warning was was certainly justified. Mm, yeah, uh, I think we, we will return to, to some of, of the points. But for now, I, I want us to proceed to the second um, press uh, briefing you you issued this one on the 11th of February. And the, the title of the briefing is Finding a Path to Peace in Ethiopia's Tigray Region. So this um, press briefing was issued after the involvement of Eritrean troops um, had become clear that the Aksu massacre had been reported, I think at this point in time. And one of the points, one of the solutions that you suggest in that briefing is you say that Eritrean troops should withdraw and you use the word um, curtail. Now, I know that you, many people uh, <clears throat> have objected to that word, including myself, and you have since uh, clarified how you use that word. So if you believe that you have explained that already, we can skip it if you have a few words to say about Not that. Publicly, I, I, I haven't explained it publicly, so that's fine. Yeah, so what, what, right. happened, there, what happened there is it was a mistake. Um, and actually, I, I was confused about the definition of of curtail or the normal usage. Um, and one of the points that I made in that email I, I, I sent you to someone else was that crisis group, we repeat ourselves in publications as a way of kind of, you know, like a technique of writing to kind of um, drive home a point to readers by repeating yourself. Um, so, and then we, but we don't repeat ourselves word for word, right? So we use slightly different language. Um, so it, I think it's explicit that we were calling for the Eritrean troops to, to withdraw, but we did use slightly different phrasing to describe that. Um, I can't like draw, draw down or. I think you, you say, you, you say among other things, um, curtail that that's the one word. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That you, you, yeah, yeah. And I think that's, I think that's, a, to be honest, um, it was a mistake. You know, I'm not going to blame my editors. Yeah. You know, I take responsibility for that my, myself. Yeah, we but didn't that, mean we didn't, we didn't we didn't mean reduce. We meant withdraw. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it would have been it would have been bizarre if you uh, made that kind of recommendation. But the, yeah. one one thing that that is um, uh, well that that is absent in the recommendation is you don't say that the federal troops should withdraw from from Tigray. Yeah. You, you don't go as far as to to say that. Yeah. Could you yeah. could you elaborate as to why that wasn't deemed um, the right recommendation to make at that point in time, given that they they weren't accepted in Tigray, that they were committing atrocities, and I, I believe that you had this evidence at that point in time, but you you didn't say anything to to that effect, and yeah. I'm wondering if there was any any rationale for that. 
Sure. And I, I think I should, you know, probably for the record, make clear that it, this isn't something that I've discussed with colleagues and with my managers. And so there is no organizational position on this. Um, but, I, but I'm going to try and, res, res, you know, res, respond. It is kind of like my interpretation of things. Um, so I think when we make these recommendations, we only make a few of them. They're not extensive, they're not comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, the sort of most problematic elements of the intervention obviously was the Amhara um, annexation of Western Tigray and a piece of Southern Tigray, but also the Eritrean presence, which was completely covert and unofficial and, and was causing outrage amongst Tigrayans and also resulting in lots and lots of atrocities. So these were the most sort of egregious elements um, of the intervention and, and the occupation and, 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 of, and of the conflict. So, you know, they're not comprehensive recommendations, but these were the things that we prioritized, essentially. Um, and that's, I think, why there wasn't necessarily such a focus on the federal forces. But that's a, that is a bit of a strange, a strange answer. But I think you know, we were obviously struggling um, because you know, you're in a circumstance where, and this is a bit more of a general point, I think, about baby crisis group and kind of peacemaking and in these types of situations. I mean, you know, we're saying kind of don't, don't do that, you know, like retrace your steps, like go back to peaceful politics, have a dialogue, uh, hold a ceasefire, but no, no one was interested in it. Um, so there's always this, we were discussing this as an organization just, just last week. There's always a balance between idealism and pragmatism that we're trying to strike. Um, we're thinking, well, how can we begin to make suggestions which are both you know, towards an idealistic goal, but are somewhat pragmatic? And you know, I think that's where the Eritrea and Amhara recommendation came from. We can get into how like, actually impractical that is in reality, and that's just how kind of screwed this situation is. Um, that's where it came from. The other issue is that we are always trying to speak to both sides in a conflict, which obviously really enrages people who, are, who have taken a side in the conflict as people are forced to do in conflict, right? It's a life or death situation. You don't have the option to just stick around in the middle like I do or crisis group do. Um, so we were also trying to speak to the federal government. And you know, if we come out and say um, you know, that the intervention was completely illegal um, and that you know, not, not only that, but all of the federal government, all of the federal government's right to have federal institutions and federal officials, including the federal military in Tigray, is you know, not acceptable and they must withdraw all federal troops outside of Tigray. I mean, that is a pretty like bold position to take and would certainly be construed in Addis as us taking the side of those in Tigray um, who argued for um, you know, some form of conf you know, confederalism, um, or, 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 or ultimately secession. So realistically, that's not a position we were going to take. And as you mentioned, you know, we, we and myself had been struggling to confirm um, the Eritrean troop presence. Um, I, I knew it was there, but to, you know, to confirm sufficiently to publicize it. And then all other elements of the conflict were very difficult to authoritatively understand and then publicize. I knew what was going on, but it was a question of really being firm about it. And so one of the things was, you know, people, well, there was a d discussion at crisis group, you know, just how are the people reacting <clears throat> in Tigray to the interim administration? How is the interim administration operating at the lower echelons, you know, the Kebele and Warada level and, and this type of thing? So there was a whole kind of like process of trying to work out what the actual situation was and, and to what extent um, at least this, you know, federally um, imposed interim government was being accepted by the people. And these were still things that I was, I was trying to work out. So that's kind of another reason why you might not get such a focus on, on, on telling the federal government just to back out completely. Um, but the, the main one is, is the impracticality um, of that suggestion. And, and we are trying to find a balance between saying things which are, yes, idealistic, but also somewhat practical, which is not mm. easy. And yeah, 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 I, I do, I do. Uh, uh, sharing in that that that's a difficult uh, balance to maintain but the, uh, the other um, recommendation that you make in that briefing mm -hmm. uh, is you say that it would be 
it would be better if the uh, Amhara militia forces that were um, committing atrocities and ethnic cleansing, really, no, I, that is not you, you wording, I know, but even no. the, the, the US um, um, Secretary of State um, <clears throat> has used that, that wording, so it's not a far-fetched wording to use. But you say that they should withdraw. Uh, that's one mm -hmm. of the things you say. Mm -hmm. And the, the Ethiopian government's uh, counter-argument to that, and they have issued press uh, briefings multiple times addressing that, they say that Ethiopia as a sovereign state is entitled to deploy forces wherever it, it deemed it necessary. And they say that it's inappropriate for, for, for people to say that they, the federal government sh should withdraw its forces from certain areas when that decision should be left to the Ethiopian government. Do you have any opinion on, on that, on that, on that argument that the Ethiopian government uh, seems to, to employ? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, we could look at it again, you can look at this from a few perspectives, right? I think, you know, for crisis group, if, you know, external actors to be saying, do this, do that. I mean, no one likes that, right? It, you know, no people really like that. So part of it is just a, a rejection of being like told what to do by, by foreigners and crisis groups said it, you know, the US said it. And so you get that kind of vehement react, reaction, stay out of our business, hands off Ethiopia, right? Hands off Ethiopia, this is the new, and, but this is, these are like, you know, perennial dynamics in terms of the, the interactions between states and more powerful states with other states and all, and all the rest of it. So part, part of it just stems from, from that, you know, this like get out of our business, you know, we, we're the ones who make these decisions. Part of it's that. The other one is more specific to the Ethiopian situation, which is that obviously from the, you know, the, the generally the Tigrayan perspective, certainly the pro Tigray's government, former government, the government, their position of course, is that they're the legitimate government um, and that they were trying to op operate um, and stay true to their interpretation of the federal system and that the rights that are granted to regional governments within it. Um, and and, and so, so they see this as, as completely outrageous because you can't just, as a federal government, you can't just go around sending you know, your neighboring regions, security forces to oust your government if you consider your government legitimate. Clearly that's an outrage as you see it. If they then start like parceling up your land, um, committing um, major atrocities and, and, and you know, in, in doing something to displace tens of thousands of people, uh, annex territory and set up their own administration. Well, obviously that's completely utterly outrageous from the from the perspective of that government which is the suffering that and considers itself legitimate it uh, doesn't need explaining right and then on the yeah. on the flip side of this of this debate we have the whole um that the, the tigray government was illegitimate uh, the junta narrative the click narrative and now we have the tplf as a terrorist organization so they've completely delegitimized that regional government um and then of course as as part of the a security emergency um, that they say was created, then they start to legitimize the use of those regional security forces to support the federal forces. Um, and so that's the sort of Ethiopian, this, this sort of my understanding of this, how these types of arguments stem not just from that um, reaction to foreigners telling you what to do, but also from the specifics of this situation. Um, what we should note here though, um, is that even if there has been this defensive reaction to being told, the federal government being told by externals to remove the Amhara forces, is there a federal policy, a re is there a realistic federal policy about Amhara's um, administering, taking over the administration of sections of Tigray? I don't, I'm not aware of one. The only thing that the prime minister said is that this has to be sorted out by constitutional means and some references to the border commission, which, you know, crisis group has also made, but that doesn't reflect the political reality. Um, these areas were taken by force, of course, from the Amhara perspective, taken back by force in the same manner that they say they were taken from them. And they have set up a new administration there. There's no federal policy about that. So, 
you know, it's, it seems obviously um, an unconstitutional occurrence. Um, so you've got to sort of question, um, I think it sort of seems a bit hip hypocritical of the government to be saying, not hypocritical, but just very um, incomplete for the government to be saying, we can do whatever we want with regional security forces, but not paying any yeah. attention to the fact <clears throat> that um, Amhara government has taken over the administration of what used to be known as Western Tigray zone yeah. and se se sections of Northwest Tigray, I think. Yeah. As well as, well, well as I, sections I, of Southern Tigray. Yeah, I think Southern and um, a, a huge swath of uh, Western Tigray. But I, I was um, I was trying to play the, the devil's advocate there. Otherwise I completely uh, agree mm -hmm. with you that, that the Amhara militia uh, should be allowed and do the the unspeakable atrocities that they have been doing is of course unquestionable is 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 beyond uh, belief and I, I completely agree with you but because it's a lie that has been told a thousand times and like any lie that has been told a thousand times it could be accepted at some point if if people don't go out of their way to refute it and nobody has been interested in doing that so that, that's why I. What, what, what I would say is I, I referenced the tens of thousands displaced, right, to, to Shide, which happened in like February and March, I think. That was a new round of displacement from Western Tigray. Yeah. Um, I just, just want to make the point quickly. You know, obviously, we have that hugely contested Mykadra uh, atrocity. Um, and then I think, in general, the story about what has happened in Western Tigray is yet to be told. Yes, Secretary of State Blinken said it was ethnic cleansing. Has the US government evidenced that? No, they haven't. Um, but it's taken a while in this conflict for the truth to start to emerge. Not a truth which is accepted by everyone, but those people who are trying to look at the situation with some degree of objectivity. Um, and my point is that we will find out a lot more about what happened in Western Tigray. Uh, Amnesty International is working on a report. Um, other organizations will do more detailed reports, and that will shed more light on the atrocities that you refer to. I absolutely do not, I'm, I'm absolutely not you know, denying that they occurred. But we, I, as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot still to be understood in detail about what occurred, um, and not just in November, you know, also into December and January and, and, and February as well in, in Western Tigray. Yeah, but I, I do understand that you demand a, a higher standard of evidence than I would. So th there are things that I deep down know have happened uh, yeah. for which I don't have concrete evidence. And I wouldn't yeah. make you to, to say those same things because again you have a different standard and i have a different one yeah and, and, I, and i've heard absolutely you know, shocking stories including uh, basically genocidal attitudes um from um invading intervening forces from amhara um but it's piecemeal um it's it, i don't have a comprehensive <clears throat> picture um of what happened in in anything like um you know like all of all of western tigray so that's that's my point the evidence of those atrocities is, is a bit piecemeal at the moment. We need to get comprehensive, more comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. But uh, William, you say that the the uh, um, the Maikadra massacre uh, is a contested one. Sure. And I would I would I would disagree with that uh, because number one, the 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 the, the only um, body that has um, spoke spoken about that is the, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. And they produced a report at, at a time when the Ethiopian government was desperately, desperately looking for um, incriminating evidence to tell the Ethiopian people that, well, look, this is what the TPLF is doing on you. And that is why we need to pay any price to, to get rid of it. And that was why the report needed to be produced in that hasty manner. And I haven't seen any other independent body who, who has gone to my cadre and said those exact same things that the Human Rights Commission has said. And that to me doesn't seem to be a contested story. If anything, I would say a fabricated story, but you, you, you would have more to say maybe about that. Yeah, yeah, just, just again, try and, be, try and be brief. I think um, I mean, it's contested in the sense that there's two sides to it and the clashing narratives. It's contested in in that sense, um, I mean, my, my understanding is I, I, I think the Human Rights Commission was, was wrong to publish so quickly, uh, two weeks after their visit. 
it was a government, it was a, it was a visit and research that was conducted in the heat of the war and the intervention. It's far from uh, ideal circumstances to be researching these things. To my understanding, uh, it was a completely one-sided report. They did not speak to Tigrayans who fled the area. And indeed, um, the commissioner cast doubt on the, some of the refugee testimony, which was pretty unwise of him. Um, but um, I don't think it was entirely fabricated. And I think that there were both Tigrayan and Amhara civilian victims in my cadre. I think it was an incident of, of brutal intercommunal violence in a, in a location where there had been a lot of communal tensions brewing and then they exploded um, as the intervention occurred. Um, I think um, it's a question of, you know, what proportion of civilians from the different, the two groups make up the bodies in those mass graves. Um, whether we will ever find that out, um, I'm not sure. Um, but I have no doubt that both Amhara and Tigrayan civilians died en masse in my cadre um, on the 9th and, and 10th of November. I, I would readily concede that there might have been uh, communal uh, conflicts and people might have died in that process. But I, I say this um, hand on heart. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see why the TPLF or any force affiliated with the TPLF would commit atrocities. I, I just can't see any rational yeah, no, as to no. why they, they might. And there hasn't yeah. been any, the TPLF doesn't have a, a, a track record of committing atrocities in, in general. So no, um, unless there was a, a, a shock departure from, 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 uh, from tradition, uh, I, I don't see why they might have committed. But again, I, I see- I, I'm, the, I'm your, talking your about- yeah, I'm talking yeah, about I, fantastic. I'm talking about very, very, very severe, brutal form of self-defense from the local Tigrayan community. I'm talking about retaliation, waves of violence, attacks occurring, and then retaliatory attacks. I'm not talking about an orchestrated something orchestrated in in Mechale. Uh, no one's proved yeah. that. EHRC said there was local officials involved. You know, quite maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe to some extent that occurred. And in terms of the propaganda value of the event. It was actually a very important um, piece of propaganda, a uh, piece of the official narrative, I should say, um, that along with the Northern Command attack, which really continued to spur um, those um, intervening forces um, and, and uh, generated considerable popular anger and support, therefore, for the intervention in Amhara and across Ethiopia as well. So there was a huge propaganda boost for the federal intervention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, pardon me if, if we are dwelling on this for, for more than we, we should, but the, the other recommendation that you, you make uh, in this briefing is you advise Abiy to work with them, with them uh, interim government. And that seems to me that you are, um, in a way, lending legitimacy to the interim government. Now, this is sure. a government that is wholly totally despised by by literally every Tigran. If you were yeah. to go to Matale and ask 1000 people about what their view is on the on the on the interim government, it would be a total rejection. And my, my, my question to you is why did you why did you think it would be easy for the Abiy government, even assuming that this is a benign government that is that has the, the, the interest of the Tigray people at heart and they want yeah. to work with the interim government, even granting that, the people wouldn't accept that because the people don't believe that a government they elected is deposed and another one is imposed from, from, from above. That seems to be something that the Tigray people can't contend with. Now, given yeah. that, why did you believe that th this would be an easy thing to do for the federal government? So just as a bit, a bit, bit of context, um, <clears throat> I'm the lead author of these reports. Obviously, I'm the Ethiopia analyst. Uh, they are written in conjunction with colleagues. Um, and um, that means that we have to reach a consensus on things. Um, I take responsibility for everything in the report, but that is the process. Um, you know, this is not me blogging away on Facebook or something. You know, this is a this is a, a lengthy process of 
of, of, of generating the publication. And, and like I say, it's a, it's a product of consensus within the organization. And we had specific debates about this. I raised and others raised the types of points that you're making. Um, and if you recall that previous answer, the sort of fog of war stuff, like we didn't really know and still don't know exactly what's happening on the ground by any means. Um, and I think there was, as you're trying to assess the situation on the ground um, and the sort of public opinion, um, I suppose, there's some sort of, you're trying to make an assessment of the political attitude, how that's feeding into the war and how that's impacting um, sort of livelihoods and the economy and, and society, right? And I think one of the things that it's still valid to be concerned about was a complete, um, a complete sort of dissolution of, of all of Tigray's um, governing and <clears throat> socioeconomic um, st structures and institutions and systems, right? Um, and this, of course, is in the context of the TPLF being an incredibly dominant part um, of Tigray's um, government and economy and, and society. So it was about this, um, this question and it, you know, we, we, people were talking about you know, the sort of concept of debarthification in Iraq and essentially would we get even worse chaos and therefore outcomes for the Tigrayan people um, if there was a, a decision by the federal government and its imposed interim government if there was a decision to not work with anyone um, who was a member of the TPLF or even perhaps associated and supportive of the TPLF, would that lead to an e even greater and more rapid breakdown of degrading society and worse outcome for civilians? That was the thinking. Um, the obvious weakness is, is what you have raised, which is the political um, attitude um, in, in Tigray and the reality that um, that interim government is not seen as, as legitimate. Um, and there's a lot of support um, for the, the TPLF government. Um, but again, to reiterate, at that time, because we weren't sure exactly of what was happening on the ground and, and what the attitude of people were, because you know, if we have a different scenario where, um, <clears throat> where the TPLF had not just been sort of removed from power and significantly destabilized, but if it had just been you know, demoralized and completely defeated, well, I think that would have led people to say, we didn't want that to happen. Um, but you know, that governing authority that we know so well has come to the end of its time and then they would start looking for alternatives, right? And I think that's where the whole business of those lower level officials and the interim government come into it. Um, as things have become clearer, as things have evolved, like I say, um, it's pretty obvious um, that there is you know, very considerable support um, for that government and the, 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 the Tigray Defense Forces, which contains the TPLF and Tigray's leadership within it has stabilized and is, is fighting a, a pretty serious um, um, struggle, resistance struggle. Um, but at that time, that, the, the type of thinking that I've tried to explain was that's what led to that. Sort of yeah, story. yeah, I, I, I understand. I think that the, the general point to me, um, <clears throat> Is any any solution, any potential solution that 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 tries to bring the, the war and and, and it to an end should take the, the the people's view into account. That 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 to me is very important. What, what do the people actually want? And um, so far, nobody has really been asking that, that that question. Okay, there is this conflict. There is federal government. There is a TPLF. There are other parties. But what do the, the Tigray people actually want? And my understanding is that people, and when I say people, I'm including people who have very, very serious disagreements with the, with the TPLF, sure. believe that it's entirely up to the people of Tigray what kind of government that, that they elect in, in Matale. It is, it's not up to the federal government what type of government uh, is, um, um, at, 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 is, is uh, installed in, in, in Matale. And to me, Anybody who is trying to bring about a solution to the crisis should should ask that simple but very very important question: What do the people want? Yeah. And and so sorry to interject, and I think you know to state the obvious, it's it is hard, you know, to make a, an assessment of that given the current conditions in Tigray. But 
Um, I think you know myself and, and Crisis Group and, and many other uh, interested like observers here. Um, essentially, what we see is an attempt to batter the people of Tigray into submission um, and to accept an imposed authority upon them. Um, there's two things to say about that. One is that that is clearly entailing massive violence being afflicted um, against the Tigrayan population. And number two, it's not going to work. It's going to produce the opposite effect. It's going to make the Tigrayan people less inclined to cooperate and do the bidding and take the instructions of the federal authorities. So, you know, for me, for NG in Nairobi, um, to sit here and say, I know the views of 6 million Tigrayans is always going to be a bit ridiculous, right? I don't, but, but I do know, I, I, am, I am clear, and we are clear at Crisis Group that this attempt to impose authority onto the people of Tigray is one, causing massive violence, two, is just totally counterproductive and not going to work. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, and one more point there, you, you say that the, the US government should try to urge uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia to be, to be involved in, in the process. And I, I, was, I was wondering what, what leverage do you think these countries have in, in, in Ethiopia? What was the thinking there? Political relationship uh, at high levels with the prime minister particularly, financial leverage. Um, they've been something of a lender of last resort, right? An emergency source of financing for the government, both under the EPRDF, but mm. also under the ABPP era. Um, there's a suspicion, strong suspicion, that the UAE, along with the Trump administration and other actors, gave something of a green light for this operation in Tigray. Um, obviously, there's the drone allegations. Um, so if they're actively involved in supporting and fueling this they need to desist um, and then can they also join the international chorus saying ceasefire prioritize humanitarian access come to some form of um, start some form of political process to try and resolve these disputes can the uae and the saudis and and whoever join that international chorus and lend their weight um, whether it's their financial muscle or those political relationships that i talked about to try and support that international push. Yeah. Um, I, I, also the regional stuff. Um, yeah. The Renaissance yeah. Dam, Egypt, Sudan. Yeah. And also the links with uh, <coughs> Asmara and President Isaias. We've seen the developments at ASAP, obviously. Yeah. But, well, th there, is, there is a lot more in, in, in that briefing that we could talk about, but in the, in the interest of time, I, I will I will skip and go to to the third um, briefing that you have written on 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 Tigray war. It's titled Ethiopia's Tigray war, a deadly stalemate. Mm -hmm. So that, that is how you characterize it. Is is it still your your personal position that it is a stalemate now? Yes, but all these things have to be, you know, to be to be qualified and. Ethiopia is incredibly volatile politically. We don't know what's going to happen next. Um, the Tigray situation is volatile. The regional situation with Sudan and Egypt um, is volatile. Oromia, Benishangul. <coughs> there's plenty of there's plenty of things that <coughs> that could happen. So, if you know the Ethiopia Sudan nosedive in their relations, if that ended up into a major interstate war, but that would have a massive impact on the, on the Tigray conflict dynamics. Um, it would be a massive challenge for Ethiopia's federal military, um, and also for Eritrea's military, looks like it would be party to the conflict. Um, it would provide opportunities for Sudan to support um, the Tigray defense forces, be a, could be a huge game changer. So it's very volatile, all sorts of things that could happen. But I think, you know, with this situation as it is now, um, quite a, an entrenched resistance from the Tigray Defense Forces, a, an extent of territorial control, which I don't really understand in rural areas, but it does seem very strong support from the rural population, as well as the urban population, but the, the rural population most directly. 
engaged with the rebellion, uh, with the TDF. Um, and then obviously the, the federal government, the Eritrean troops in control of roads, checkpoints, degrees yeah. government, government apparatus in the cities. So, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the stalemate we're talking about. Um, you're not, you can't really defeat this resistance because it's popular unless something truly uh, genocidal occurs um, because it's a, it's a popular resistance as, as we understand it. Um, so, you know, what's the, what's the end game there from the federal um, and allied forces? And then on the Tigrayan side, you know, yes, ability to maintain a position uh, to hold its own in, in sort of these conventional battles that are occurring, certainly the ability to hit um, Ethiopian and Eritrean convoys and whatever logistics depots and things and the ability to sustain itself, I guess, through the rural population in terms of uh, food and I guess, you know, medical supplies, and they say they capture a lot of um, ammunition and equipment when they win battles. But are they able to regain the conventional capacity, even that they lost at the beginning of the war through the drone strikes and the other um, battles and, and aerial targeting? Um, are, they, are they able to regain the sort of conventional capacity needed to push the federal military, Ethiopian federal military and the Eritrean military out of those roads, away from those checkpoints and take control of Tigray's cities and, and government in, in, in totality? It doesn't seem like something which is going to happen in, in in short order, and I mean certainly not within months. Um, so that's that's why we think there's a, a stalemate. Yeah. Um, so um, this is probably my almost my last question, and will be will be done. I think we are on the one hour thirty. Yeah, minutes we can one. we can push on to a, a natural. A natural conclusion, as long as we don't all right. spend all, all right. day. I'm that, sure we could spend all day talking about this. this okay. well, talk about. I, I would, I, I would be super happy to do that. Okay. Um, so, given that this is this is a, a a stalemate, and given the 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 state of affairs, given the atrocities that have been committed, and some people would argue genocide, and given the sense of animosity that has been created between the Tigray people and and Ethiopians uh, due to the, the lack of solidarity and support that has been uh, shown in, in Addis Ababa and elsewhere. And worse, the opposite, right? Support for the war. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, public open support for, for, for the war, uh, although it was a sport game. Um, and given that, I think it was two weeks ago, the, the federal government has designated the TPLF as a terrorist organization. And that seems to, um, what the intention of that seems to be to make calls for negotiation with the TPLF a non-starter, right? And I have seen actually- They, were, they, already, they already were, right? They already, yeah. yeah. Given all this, this mess, what do you think should happen now? Now, I know this is, too broad a question, but I thought this would give you a, a, an opportunity to go into what you think or you believe should be done now to, to end the war. Okay, I mean, look, to, to answer that from an idealistic perspective is easy, right? I mean, I just said that the war is kind of unwinnable unless something truly you know, epically horrific occurs because of the the position of the Tigrayan population, as I understand it, right? So, you know, this is a terrible, uh, a terrible path that 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 we are on in terms of this in terms of this conflict. Um, there's no there's no immediate solution to it. So, obviously, what needs to happen, ideally, is that people need to recognize this. They need to recognize that the assumptions that they made at the outset of the war. Um, perhaps about the TPLF's level of unpopularity in, in Tigray, the ability to win this war, therefore, quickly, um, were wrong. Um, and they need to recognize that, as I said, you're not going to be able to, to, to batter the people of Tigray into submission. Um, this is based on your know, fundamental misreading of the situation, as well as, you know, a sense of vengeance and that type of thing, whether it's from Isaias and his 
and allies or the TPLF's domestic political opponents, you know, whether, whether in the form of Abiy and his allies or people who lost out in, in 2005 um, and, the, and the fallout from 2005 and <clears throat> the Amhara nationalists who um, have been campaigning for the, against the TPLF and, and the system, the federal system and for the return of the territory. That, yeah, that's what's driving this war. Like the, 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 any kind of like logical argument that this is a, a way to enhance Ethiopian unity um, or benefit the Tigrayan people. I mean, they're, they're preposterous at this, at this stage. These things need to be properly acknowledged, uh, understood and acknowledged, and then digested um, by um, the people who are um, continuing to perpetuate this war as in this is unfinished business. We have to remove and defeat the TPLF entirely, which means defeating the TDF entirely, which essentially means defeating the Tigrayan people entirely. This is a, a disastrous um, approach. Um, whatever people's rationale is for opposing the TPLF or opposing the, the threats of the constitutional order or state integrity as they saw it. I mean, these are exactly the same arguments that I was making in, in October and, and when I, in November when I was deported from Ethiopia and, and upset people in Addis. But the evidence bears true that this is a disastrous conflict um, and therefore there needs to be a rethink. Now, exactly how we position things so that, you know, we can kind of negotiate with a terrorist group now is very, very difficult. Um, but this, this is the path that needs to be taken. So first it would be a ceasefire, cessation of hostilities, prioritizing humanitarian access, establishing a permanent ceasefire, some form of monitoring, and then the restarting of some form of political process to try and bridge the differences. Um, a very, very difficult politics, of, of, of course. And, but that's clearly what, what needs to happen from, from our perspective and, 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 and my perspective. And elements like the um, <clears throat> Amhara forces withdrawal, the Eritrean forces withdrawal, would just be the sort of nuts and bolts of that overarching process. And maybe you know, something that I have discussed with people, um, and I, I noticed there was a good article in Addis Standard that said the same thing, which is that given that the Tigrayan position um, and opposition and essentially resistance is broader than the TPLF now. It's in support of the TPLF run regional government, Tigray Defense Forces, um, people like Zadkan, leading members, opponents of the TPLF who are now opposing the federal intervention in Tigray. Can the Tigrayan people um, collectively um, inside Ethiopia and abroad um, do something to create an entity which the federal government can feasibly negotiate with because you know having Abby sit around the table with Katachi Reda and Debret Sion and these people it's you know we're into the realm of like political fantasy I think really and and so therefore you know, could some sort of broad Tigrayan organization which reflects some sort of like collective Tigrayan position be created that can help us get out of this mess um, because as much as the problem is that people are committed to the conflict even if they were to say you know, hang on, this is disastrous, we need to do something different, then, we're, then, then there needs to be something in place so that the idea of negotiations, a meaningful negotiation, um, becomes possible. And, and that needs to be an organization which the federal government in these changed circumstances and changed attitudes can feasibly negotiate with. Not, again, not the TPLF because they've classified it as a terrorist organization, but then on the Tigrayan side, it needs to be both representative of the Tigrayan people, but it also needs to be representative of the TPF um, as the entity which the Tigrayan people elected to run their regional government. This is also like a thorny political issue, um, but I think it's one that people should, should start thinking about, as that as standard article said, um, because it would be a, a terrible thing if, if there was a change in approach to the conflict, but then it would just proved impossible to get some form of political process going. Yeah. Um... And I think you, you have written an article for The Guardian and you make um, similar points. Um, but I, I don't have the, the piece. About the, more of, about the national, the national uh, yeah, challenges. And, yeah, and in my, um, to my understanding, you seem to suggest that one way to, in the long term at least, not, not, not really with regard to, to the war, but in the long term, um, what would make Ethiopia stable is if those political organizations and parties with extremes views, again, that, that I think that's your 
maybe you don't use that, that wording directly, but those nationalist extremist parties should be in a way tamed and that there should be kind of an effort to centralize the, 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 the country. You seem to, to suggest that uh, to okay. me. No, yeah, I think, yeah. You could, uh, 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 pardon me for, for misrepresenting your views. So, uh, you, you have a chance to correct me, but that, that is how I understood it. And you can, you can expand on it now. Um, I mean, I think, I'm, there was, I'm, I think there was the usual kind of like moderate middle ground suggesting compromises and consensus type kind of theme to the article, sort of stuff that you get from, from me and from crisis group. Um, I think, I don't, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I think what you're referring to is this line where the article was kind of like, you know, Tigray is an absolute horror show, you know, something, you know, need to change trajectory there. Also, there's all these massive problems in Ethiopia and um, these fundamental divisions. And we think that the, the prime minister kind of focusing on his agenda and the PP agenda as much as it exists to the exclusion of other political actors is a repeat of historical errors. Um, it's not an inclusive process. It's excluding key actors and is gonna perpetuate a cycle of violence. So that's how we set things up. And then, so the answer is more inclusive politics. And then, and then it's like, well, what does that mean in terms of this constitutional debate and everything that comes with it? And I think that's where you know, the allegations you're, you're making um, stem from, because you know, one of the things that we said was that you know, if there was a com constitutional compromise, um, you know, you wouldn't want to, you won't, you won't, you won't want to radical a reconfiguration of the federation because you're going to create all that blowback that's already occurring um, from regional entities, let's say. Um, but we did say that you also have to kind of give something to the, you know, to the side that's very concerned, obviously, about Article Thirty Nine um, and about the uh, so ethno linguistic definition of. Um, administrative areas and the ethnic ethnicization of politics and, and society. And, and so we're just talking about, can, you know, can something be done to constrain self-determination rights? I, I, I do understand like how sensitive these things is, you know, how much time Ethiopians have spent debating Article 39 and the reasons for it. But you know, when I covered the Sadama um, statehood, it, it, it really is untrammeled self-determination, right? So any NNP just needs to get together, you know, has its own administrative area, and then it just needs to get its council, um, its own legislative body to vote for a higher status um, of self-determination of, of kind of author authority within the federal system. And then you just kind of move up, up purely of your own volition, potentially to secession. I understand again the importance of self-determination and the fact that it's part of the United Nations Charter and, and all of this stuff and, and why it was necessary or why it was inserted into the federal constitution. But in terms of stabilizing the federal system and in terms of achieving a consensus amongst Ethiopia's different political constituencies, it's just, is there something that can be done to in some way constrain um, those self-determination rights? Um, it's yeah that that was the approach, and I hope I haven't gone down a completely yeah, yeah. Tan tangent yeah. here. But I think that's what you were pushing at in terms of yeah. But I wasn't well, saying I, think, I wasn't I saying think, ex exclude all ethno nationalist voices. It, you, the language you use made me sound like the comments that the attorney general made about um, the <laughs> um, <clears throat> the Oromo uh, politicians that, that they have arrested. I wasn't yeah. Wasn't saying that. But, but I, I take I take the words back. No no no, no problem. But I think that this debate. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of philosophical whether you think um, Article uh, 39 is a fundamentally a good or a bad thing. Because I'm, um, I'm also talking about 47, right? The, uh, the regional statehood. I think it's 47. The regional. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I was I was alluding to the to the sure. to the article that yeah sure. that gives provision for independence. Sure. And I, I ask this because in, in Tigray circles, at least now. Given yeah. what has happened, yeah, um, the you are more and more likely to to see people who um who want independence, right? They would say that anything short of independence is an insult to the people that are being 
massacred for who they are. And given that there really isn't a huge reservoir of oneness in Ethiopia, maybe the, the best course of action is independence or at least more, more devolution that, than exists now, more, more decentralization of power than exists now. And the, the, the right solution is to find a way of creating more autonomy and still maintain the country Ethiopia. So that, that seems to be the kind of the, the wisdom among Tigrayan scholars and Tigrayan advocates and, and, and analysts, but you don't seem to, to share in that kind of view. If, if, um, of, of, of Tigrayan independence as a nation state? Maybe, maybe not outright independence, but at least more autonomy than existed before the war, for instance. So they sort of, as I like something like a confederal, yeah, like sort of like the Abide Sahai thing I was talking about. So states' rights are protected at the constitutional level in a more clearer way, minority states. Right. Um, I think all these things have to be negotiated. I think at this point, you know, just like th these would these would be the, the subject of of these very what ultimately would, would be incredibly difficult um, negotiations. Um, I think the, pro the problem that we're confronted now is obviously that there's a, there's a complete there's the, the most fundamental imaginable difference of opinion about the legitimacy of Tigray's government. The first thing we'd have to do is reach, begin to reach some sort of consensus on that. I mean, there's no exercising Article 39 rights in a meaningful way now, because this is just being decided by a war. Um, the time to exercise Article 39 rights would have been um, prior to the um, regional election, um, because Tigray, in the eyes of the federal government, was still a legitimate, its government was still a legitimate member of the federation. So there's no peaceful political process to independence. So then we're just looking at various types of, of warfare to decide political outcomes. And suffice to say that there is no, again, no peaceful path, not just to independence, but also to greater autonomy for Tigray. That would have to be the subject of a negotiation um, and in completely different circumstances. Um, but at the moment, it's just, it's just war to defend the rights of Tigray's government as people see it. Or, yeah. To, cap, to, cap, to capture the, um, the, uh, the, the criminal politicians from, from that region and restore the integrity of the federal military and, and all the rest of it. Um, and I, I, you know, maybe just a quick piece to add, um, the Amhara, the, the, you know, the, the, the Wolkait, um, Tigade, Zalemt, and now Humera issue, um, that has to be war um, unless the Tigrayan um, nationalist, Tigrayan independence proponents accepted that um, a Tigray nation state um, would not have an international border to the West and it would be willing to give up on land that it had previously claimed as essentially Tigrayan. Um, and then there's the Eritrea question and the access to the sea issue. Um, would a Tigrayan nation state want to be surrounded by a hostile Ethiopia and a hostile Eritrea? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. So therefore, what the, again, the path is violence and warfare and regime change in Asmara at the very, very least. So I don't, it's, this, isn't, this, yeah. isn't, this, isn't, this isn't stuff we're gonna come out and advocate for, right? All we would say is like, this is, this, the politics has turned horrifically violent and we need to turn the dial back towards people politics. And then when, when we do that, then there's all sorts of incredibly thorny political issues that you rightly raise. Um, but, you know, unless we get to a point where these things are being discussed peacefully, then it's, it's just war. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but I, I do, I do completely share in the concerns and yeah, actually, I, sure. I, I don't understand that it's very difficult to go into the uh, practicality of it. So, hmm. but it's not something that I would uh, blithely recommend. It's something that requires a, a lot of discussion, debate and, and um, uh, arguments. Yeah, but and maybe it's those, more of a Tigrayan internal discussion. The relevance is a Tigrayan absolutely. internal discussion at the moment. Yeah, yeah. but those those who are um, in favor of independence, um, what they would likely say is there isn't really any glue that, that holds us together as a country, as a nation in Ethiopia. 
there is nothing to be to be gained and that there is everything to be to be gained by going for independence even though that endeavor might be difficult it wouldn't we wouldn't be worse off than staying in the in the state of affairs and the status for now that would be the the argument but they would make of course more yeah and, and, and i'm yeah and i'm kind of like I'm, I'm i guess i'm talking more about the practicalities of getting there rather than the sort of justifications for independence as a desired end goal right absolutely yeah yeah uh, if if we could uh, william if we could do some um digression before i let you uh, go now more and more people seem to believe that genocide is being committed in, in Tigray. Now, I, I know that it's a very controversial issue uh, and I don't want you to, to commit yourself either way. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to elicit some, some comments on that. Um, people like Alex Duwall, for instance, I'm sure you will have uh, read uh, stuff from him. <clears throat> he, says, he says, among other things, that starvation crime is being committed and that that is deliberate and that, that could be used in the, in the service of arguing for 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 the um for the allegation of genocide being committed by Eritreans and and Ethiopians do you do you do you have any any comment on, on that do you do you do you believe those people have a point um yeah I, I spoke about this in another discussion recently and I think there's a so just a, like a legalistic version of genocide um, and then a kind of popular understanding of genocide, the popular you know, being the, the Holocaust and Rwanda prominently in people's minds, I think, um, the, the, the events that people know most about, and then the legalistic sort of destroy in whole or the intent to destroy in, in whole or in part um, a sort of ethnic group or you know, distinct, distinct community um, and the, the kind of various methods that you can that are used to to destroy that group. Um, you know, in terms of the legalistic version of things, I think you know you can make arguments definitely, um, but you could probably also make arguments about some of the stuff going on in Beni Shangul, um, some of the things that's happening in Oromia. I just in some ways, it's quite an expansive definition of genocide when you take that legalistic viewpoint. So I just wanted to just make that clear. But in terms of the popular conception, what I'm really focused on here is the logic of this war. Um, so if people accept mine and your understanding of the attitude of the Tigrayan population here, the fierce resistance to the imposition of federal authority and staunch and popular widespread support for the ousted regional leadership, TPLF leadership. And then on the other side, the absolute commitment um, from the federal government, from Eritrea's government, and then also from Amhara's government and elements associated with it to achieve their objectives in the war, um, holding onto land, reclaiming territory, ensuring that Tigray is not a, uh, Tig or Tigray nationalism is not a political threat in the near and medium term, from, it seems from the Eritrean perspective, the complete defeat of the TPLF and all those who are associated with it from the federal government perspective, no prospect of negotiations from the outset explicitly from the federal government, TPLF being classified as a terrorist group. Now, those are facts, right? Most of the things I said in the second part. I mean, people might dispute the Eritrean intentions and this type of thing. It seems like, you know, we could be fairly confident about the Tigrayan sentiment and commitment to this struggle, armed um, struggle. Well, where is this leading? Um, and I think that's my massive concern. And that's, you know, that's what informs the, some of the, the previous answer I gave about what needs to be done here. Because you know, what is what is the plan? Like, how how do how do people plan to win this war from the federal perspective by essentially maintaining an occupation um, where various methods are going to be used to discourage the Tigrayan population from supporting their ousted leaders and supporting the rights of Tigray's government as they see it? 
Well, what sort of tactics are going to be used to convince the Tigrayan population to do that? I think we're seeing it. Um, I think we see um, violent reprisals, including obviously rape and murder um, of Tigrayan um, civilians who have the temerity to express support. Um, and it's definitely for those who are associated or who are actually um, materially supporting the resistance. Um, and I think so the longer this conflict goes on, um, all of those more dramatic claims about what is occurring or, or what the outcomes are become more and more realistic. Um, and so I think that's my, my massive concern. And I think that's the most relevant kind of answer I can give about that, about that, about that genocide question. Yeah, uh, thank you. If, if I could get you, your thoughts on two more important uh, issues. Um, the, the first one is, I mean, historically, countries have gone into very controversial war and there have always been people who uh, supported war and there have always been people who opposed war, even war that, 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 that is less controversial than, than the, the one the, the Abu regime has waged on, on the people of Tigray. One of the huge shock and surprises to me has been the total absence of opposition to the war in Ethiopia from the from the intellectual class, the, like the, the total collapse of of opposition, um, and it's, it's very very difficult for me to to make sense why at least a few people in Addis Ababa wouldn't stand up and say maybe war isn't the answer, maybe we aren't doing the right thing now. I do understand there is a risk in, in doing that, that you could be thrown to jail or you could, you could be arbitrarily killed even. Is, this is a brutal, merciless regime. But even given that, you would have assumed that some people would stand up and say that this is not the way to go about it. We have to find another peaceful way of resolving conflict, political conflicts. And definitely it is not okay to let a foreign hostile country come into your own country and literally get away with murder and atrocities and, and massacres and looting and, and total destruction of infrastructure. But given that this is, this is what has been being done by Eritreans, and there isn't even a single person in Addis Ababa who has stood up and spoke against this, has, has it been a shock to you, the, the, the total absence of opposition, of voices in, in, in Ethiopian political space? Uh, to some extent, yes, um, but I mean, I think you know there are obviously some opposing, some people who've spoken up in, in Addis. Um, I would, I would say. But, I mean, um, publicly, publicly, okay. I mean, privately, they do. I, I, I would, I would imagine that there are people who are privately murmuring, not, not happy not, about non, the situation. Non, yeah, non-Tigrayan speaking up publicly. I don't know. Yeah. I hope that's. I hope that has happened. Um, yeah, I think, I think to some extent, I've been a bit, yeah, a bit, it's, it's taken aback. Um, I, but I can also understand, not legitimize it, obviously, but I can understand where it's coming from, I think. Um, there's the, those dynamics that you talked about. So there's, there's it's sort of like just sort of groupthink dynamics where people are um, just normal groupthink or they're, they're fearful. It's too high a kind of social or other cost to not going with the flow. Um, and then where's that flow coming from? Well, we, we know where it's coming from, you know? It's about the, it's about the, the, the arguments, the fierce disagreements over historical issues, allegations, perceptions of <clears throat> TPLF uh, hegemony or okay, total absolute control as people will classify it in the political security, economic and social sphere. Um, the arguments over the federal system and ethnic politics and, and, the, and the hatred um, for the system and for political parties and therefore supporters of political parties who represent pro multinational ethnic federalist positions. Um, the actual violence that's occurred in Ethiopia as a result of these political disagreements and the actions of the state, which the TPLF indeed was partly responsible for, whether it's in 2005 or various incidents across the country, the jailing and other repression of political dissidents, including in the, the media. That's where it comes from. That's the, that's the cocktail 
um, and there's enough actors who are totally bought into those, those positions, whether it's the hatred, um, or whether it's some sort of high-minded justification for removing the TPLF completely um, as the key architect and guarantor of the federal system, which they absolutely despise. Um, and therefore, sort of greater good argument that, you know, yeah, we might have to cause a lot of damage in Tigray, but it'll be worth it in the end because we'll get a better, more united Ethiopia once this cancerous tumor is excised from the Ethiopian body politic type stuff. Um, yeah, that's what these people say. So no, there's no secret about it, Tekla. Like, and I, I am, I am surprised by some of the levels of, of vengeance. I'm surprised by the levels of delusion, the, de the denial of reality. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the successfulness of the propaganda. I'm, I'm surprised by the extent, and, and it's, and it's shocking, the lack of opposition, the, lo the lack of concern for Tigrayan civilians, the lack of concern for the amount of young Ethiopian soldiers, combatants who are being killed in this war, complete disregard, as far as I can tell. Uh, absolutely shocking. Um, I am surprised by some things, but I know exactly where this, this comes from. I, 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 do, I do understand, I, and I, I agree with you that there is a general fanciful thinking in, in Addis Ababa that if we manage to get rid of this, this cancer, this evil, then Ethiopia will become if you're this, rising, the, if yeah, you're... this wonder la la land, Eden, land of Eden, whatever. That that's that's the the kind of very, yeah. You know, so we both we both yeah agree on, agree but, on but my, we do right. absolutely. My 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 surprise is there is a um, there is a refusal, a general refusal to acknowledge that there is something happening in Tigray. I'm not just in the civilian in, in the ordinary citizens, but even political parties. You might have heard that th there have been a couple of debates uh, about the, the, the sham election that they will hold in 21 of June if they don't postpone it again. And not even once have they mentioned the Tigray issue in the, in the debate. Now you would, you would think that the, the Tigray war, the war on Tigray, the genocide would be the single most important issue for political parties to debate, right, in any other country. But in Ethiopia, there was no mention of it. And that tells me that there is a desire to, to pretend that nothing is happening in Tigray. Sure. And that, that, that is something beyond comprehension to me. I, I don't know why they, they, they are making a fool of themselves. I mean, it's, it's so blatantly there. Everybody's looking at that, staring at that mass grave and they wouldn't even acknowledge that there is something happening. And I, I couldn't explain that. I think, really. yeah, I mean, I, I, I... I, I, I know what you're getting at, and I think it's a sort of, you know, people are playing sort of psychological tricks on themselves, I think, you know, they, 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 they sell a propaganda narrative, um, <clears throat> the war is over, uh, there's just a few guys, uh, old guard hiding in caves, um, and they, they create these propaganda narratives which are obviously comfortable and convenient for them, and then they end up believing them, and then they end up regurgitating them. And then, and then there's so much group thing, so there's no real disagreement. Um, and yeah, there's, there's just these incredibly like comfortable narratives that are, that are created, which people use to sort of psychologically um, insulate themselves from from the reality of the of the situation. Um, and I think yeah, partly these are probably fairly standard sort of wartime dynamics. And of course, you know. I guess you know any society that's fighting a war, there does need to be a certain amount of, obviously a, a high degree of cohesion and solidarity, and also the societal control that comes from those authorities who are who are propagating, um, who are perpetrating the the war. And so I think all of these things are are in play. Absolutely, it does lead to a fairly surreal, um, a fairly surreal situation. No doubt, mm. you see, you, yeah, you have Ethiopian journalists writing about the election, and they, they don't mention the fact that you know there's a civil war going on in one of the regions, so the election isn't scheduled there. You're like, well, did no one during <laughs> the course of producing this article say 
you know, maybe we should mention the war kind of thing. It's, it is, it is elements of it surreal. And I, I'm no expert in these things, obviously, but I think, yeah, we just have to kind of delve into those yeah. individual psychologies and also the sort of like those societal yeah. Um, yeah. dynamics, which, which create these completely bizarre yeah. outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I find that, that level of denial to be extraordinary that people would go to that length to, to pretend uh, to not see something that that is clearly there, but it's also the effectiveness. Is it, we, you know, I did I did say you know, it's also about the effectiveness of the propaganda campaign. Also, maybe the the receptiveness of society, the susceptibility of the society to the propaganda, but it's also the effectiveness of the propaganda machine. Well, I mean, there, there is no there is no denying that there is a huge um, reservoir of credulity and servility in general. Culturally speaking, I I don't want you to be dragged onto that. No, I'm not going to be. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> um, if I could, if I could, um, and I'm done with this. Um, if I could get you your uh, thoughts on press freedom in in Ethiopia. So on the one hand, you have a a man Abi Ahmed who who was loaded for um, bringing about press freedom. And on the other hand, we have you, who has been, well, essentially expelled. I think you used that, that word earlier from Ethiopia. And we we had Simon Marx also very, very crudely expelled from, from Ethiopia. They didn't even give him a chance to say goodbye to, to his family. The, the way they, they did that was embarrassing. Same as, same as me, I just don't have a family. Uh, yeah, so exactly, that's a good point. And, and and of course, you you will have heard that they they kill at point blank a, a Tigrayan journalist in 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 Matala because apparently he said something that they they didn't um, like. And in, in general, the government has made it clear that it would take uh, measures against people who um, who perpetuate who spread fake news. So and fake news to them means news that they don't like. That's what it, it means. And so on the one hand, you have this very, very sorry state of affairs when it comes to free, press freedom. And on the other hand, you see people still loading Abiy Ahmed for, for press um, freedom. And if, if you have any thoughts on this and where, where do you see this going in the long term? Sure. Um, not many people are loading it this uh, administration for press freedom now. Um, and the, the fact that they did is, is part of a broader uh, misreading and naivety and hyperbole um, that accompanied Abiy Ahmed coming to power and the promises of liberal democratic reforms, um, which were not um, really practical given Ethiopia's political challenges and other other factors. Um, so that I think that ex explains that. And I think really, you know, I think the the the, the key element here is that. Yeah, there is this hostility to to freedom of expression and and dissent, very similar to the EPRDF government, um, which the TPLF was obviously a critical part of. Um, and the tragedy for me is that if we're, we're, whether we take the Tigray conflict or the situation in Metakel Zone, and this is just the current crises, right? Metakel Zone or um, Wallagas. The situation in you know, in South Wallo and around the Atai and Oromia zone in Amhara, um, whether we take the out, the build up to the war and the outbreak of the war, Hachalu's assassination, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, all of these events need better reporting. They they all need exposing, like all of these massacres that are occurring. Um, of Amhara civilians, other, other civilians in Oromia and Bet and Metical. Um, who are the perpetrators? Who are the victims? Who's funding the perpetrators? Um, it all needs to be exposed properly. And it's, it, and it's in this darkness that, you know, I know it's a cliche, but, you know, whatever the evil flourishes, but it really does allow all of this, it, it facilitates um, all of this murky, violent political activity to occur, that lack of exposure by a half, you know, semi-respectable media. Um, 
sure we have like people like Simon trying his trying his best. You know, he's just a Ferengi like me and hadn't spent you know much time in Ethiopia. He's doing his best. Obviously, he just gets gets kicked out for for pushing too hard. Ethiopian journalists, by and large, either haven't got it in them or they just are too too scared to push um, to start asking questions of the military. Where did you get your drones from? How many soldiers have died in this war? How much does the war cost? You know, the, 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 there's just an absolute like vacuum almost of, of reliable information in Ethiopia. And you have people like me trying to assess what's, what's going on. I do my best, it's very difficult. It's getting increasingly difficult. Um, and then build analysis on top of it. But half the time we don't know what's happening in, in Ethiopia. And that is partly the product of this um, incredibly um, unsatisfactory information environment and the freedom of expression issues and the, the strength of the media. So, you know, it's just a, a tragedy because as we see the, 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 the direct repression of the media, it's the exact opposite is what is needed. One of the one of the things it won't solve everything, but one of the things that's needed to start improving this political situation is a, a genuine um, empowering of freedom of expression and strengthening of the independent, private, probably mostly media to do their job. Um, so it's just a it's been you know a, apparent how disastrous this is for the country for me for, ever since I started gaining some experience as a journalist in Ethiopia and becoming familiar with the media environment, um, and it's just a massive fundamental problem mm. yeah um thank you um william i think i i have we have taken more time than uh, i had promised you so pardon me for that um no but uh, this was a fascinating conversation for me i, I hope it was the same um for you too and i i i would like to say thank you for for the for giving me the time for this and in general for reporting on on Tigray. I know you get a, a lot of stick and criticism <clears throat> for, for for doing something including from myself but it, it doesn't mean that deep down we don't appreciate that you are trying to do a fundamentally good thing um, and you I'm sure you are um, aware more than me that you can't do anything without being criticized these days so yeah uh, thank you yeah yeah no uh, thank you, you and thank you and um yeah like you know any I think any kind of polarized political environment, you know, people doing jobs and staking out positions like mine, you're going to get flack from all sides. And I do understand that. I also understand the sensitivities of having a, a, a foreigner poke around in anyone's, in anyone's business, um, having outsiders you know, performing the role that, that I do and all the baggage, historical baggage that, that comes with that. So I do understand the frustrations, but you know, thank you for your for your, for your kind words, and I, you know, I, I, I do my do my best. Um, and then, um, what else was I going to say? Um, I, I, so what I wanted to say was, you know, thank you for the thank you for the discussion, but not just for the discussion, but also for the the manner that you um, that you probe um, and ask, you know, make you know, kind of phrase constructive criticisms, and that's appreciated. There's not enough discussions like like this that go on, um, it's, you know, it's the only way to proceed even with these very like you know, nightmarish problems that people are presented with. Um, and also, you know, it's notable that you did some, some detailed research into the crisis group publications. Um, and I always say, you know, make, make your criticisms, but be precise and specific. You know, I can't respond to vague accusations. Um, so it really helped to have a constructive conversation because you did that research and I can respond specifically. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, so thank you so much. Appreciate that and have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.